Welcome to the sunny August Sufon meeting. <laughs> uh, well, tonight we do actually have, and I'm happy to welcome Mr. Matthew Williams to our group. Now, Matthew, similarly to myself, had a cursory interest in UFO phenomena, owning and reading a few books on the subject over the years. Then in 1991, he actually witnessed a UFO for himself. And this was whilst driving over a lonely mountain road. And that developed his interest in the subject and he became a UFO investigator. In 1994, he became a consultant for UFO magazine and a writer for UFO reality and alien encounters. He also became the resident UFO specialist preparing reports for the Y Files, y -files on cable television. Uh, back in 93, he visited RAF Rudlow Manor, which was allegedly a UFO investigation space where, by the sound of it, uh, he was unceremoniously asked to leave. <laughs> uh, anyway, tell you all about that. Uh, in 1995, he uncovered documents at the Public Records Office, which allegedly confirmed the role of the RAF in major inve UFO investigations. And he will explain the full details behind his exploits and his own investigations, I'm sure. Now, a somewhat of a paradox, since 92, Matthew has also been involved in the crop circle phenomena, initially attempting to make his own basic designs and also investigating others. Now, I believe I'm right in saying he was the first person in this country to be arrested. Now then, um, yeah, I believe I'm right in saying he was the first person to be in, um, arrested and convicted uh, after constructed a crop circle in this country. Now, that may sound like the actions of an out-and-out -out hoaxer. Well, Matthew has experienced some very strange phenomena uh, and some very interesting information on the existence of paranormal effects, including sightings of UFOs and balls of light which have appeared over man-made circles to both the constructors of the crops and their subsequent visitors. So I'm sure he'll enlighten you about these during his talk. So please give us a warm Sufan welcome to Mr. Matthew Williams. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Oh, I've got to use this now. Hopefully you can all hear me at this level. Is that okay? Everybody hear me okay? I'll just keep it against my chin then. If I take it away from my chin, just say chin, <laughs> and I'll put it back on the chin. Okay, so, um, right, well, my talk is on secret government bases and UFOs. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Uh, uh, Steve it is, isn't it? Sorry. Right, yeah. Steve, yes, yeah, sorry. Steve uh, gratefully uh, introduced us there. Um, I had to pop to the toilet, so I didn't catch all of it. So I assume he's told you as much as uh, I'm just about to repeat. But um, let's get on with the, uh, the slides. I've got quite a few. Right. And a good turnout. It's not always I, I do talks for quite so many people. I think Devise's um, Go Bowls Club was, uh, was an interesting one. There was about five people there. So, and they were all, you know, like having trouble hearing me. You know, standing about five feet away. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But I think they were grateful for us to come down. So, um, if anybody's familiar with the Ogur Valley, where the Rhondda Valley goes from Triorki up across Pascombe Park down into Ogur, this is not the actual place. I, I represented the photo here, but this is, if you go down the other side, um, going into Ogur Valley, um, as you round the top of the mountain road and you've got the vista in front of you and the television transmitter up in the distance, um, I was presented with a scene that looked a little bit like this. And this was back in 1991, and this was my first UFO experience. Um, up to that point, I just had books on the subject, and I was just a reader of these <coughs> things. Um, didn't really believe in it too much. I just used to deal with it as kind of, uh, you know, an interesting side thing. You know, along with computers, it was like ghosts and the paranormal, but didn't know whether I really believed in a lot of it, to be honest. And, and funnily enough, I'd never even heard of crop circles when I went down to Wiltshire and, and sort of came to see them for the first time. And I ended up being one of the people who, who started making them. So we'll talk about that in a bit. But um, 
uh, reading these books, I didn't really have much of an idea of whether I believed in this stuff. But when I had this sighting of a, an unusual thing, driving around the, the mountain road, saw this triangular orange-shaped light sitting in front of the mountain, uh, but behind a set of trees. And I could clearly see that that was, it, that was its position, and it was shimmering at its edges. So it would almost look like a heat haze would look like, but not exactly like flames, which would sort of lick and move around. It was more sort of shimmering at its edges. And as I drove down the road, as you can see, it's similar in this type of shot here, trees past my line of sight, and um, I was skewered from the, the vision of this thing, whatever it was. And uh, then I stopped the car, reversed it back up to get another look, and whatever it was had gone. So it was a very short sighting, but uh, it was enough to kind of get me interested. But there's a little bit more to it than that. I'll tell you the extra bit as well, which is that I went down to do what I was doing that night, um, video editing. I went down to the studio, which is in Augur, did the video editing, drove back up the road. I can pretty much remember that I didn't even bother looking in the direction that this thing had been. And I don't know why I didn't do that, but I can remember that I didn't do that. So I just drove home, and when I got home, it took about a week, and then it was like somebody chucked a bucket of water in my face. And I suddenly realized that a week ago, I'd seen this thing, drove over there, drove back, didn't even bother looking in the direction where it was. And I'm thinking, why am I only remembering this now? Because that was something really mind-blowing. It was something uh, that certainly changed my life because I, I sort of started thinking about it. And what was peculiar to me was why I I'd left it go in my mind, not thought about it for a week and then suddenly had this realization of what I'd seen. And I actually had somebody in the car with me, and uh, his name was Andrew, and I remember when I was driving along, I did actually say to him, did you see that over there? And he said no, because he was looking at the, uh, he was looking across, I was looking that way at the object, and he was looking up at the nice looking hills, which were being illuminated by the moon. So he was like that looking up, and I was looking like that. And uh, so he didn't see the object, but he did see a light out of the corner of his eye. And he remembered me saying, did you see that? So there was evidence that I'd actually seen it. I hadn't just waited a week and then my brain had made this thing up. I did remember seeing something there. But I said to him, you know, well, why didn't I, why didn't I sort of look when we drove back? And I didn't even mention it for the rest of the night. And he said, no. So it was an interesting, you know, thing that uh, I've never really come to terms with what it might have been, but it was what started me off and it uh, got me investigating UFOs and then I started visiting witnesses, reading books, uh, getting involved with the various UFO organizations out there and that's what, uh, that's what started me off. So let's, uh, let's move on. And uh, eventually um, some of my work that I was doing uh, with UFO investigations, um, where's my, where's my thing? Oh, here it is. Uh, Alien Encounters magazine on the left. I don't know if anybody re remembers that when it was out. It was a long time ago, but uh, there was Alien Encounters, uh, UFO Reality, UFO Magazine. Those were the three main ones uh, prior to Graham Birdsall's sad demise. If anybody remembers Graham Birdsall, yeah, many good UFO conferences with uh, Graham. Um, and uh, Nick Redfern was very popular at uh, some of these UFO conferences in the past. He's now moved to the States. You may still see him on television, so Nick's a good friend. Um, sadly, uh, passed away uh, Dave Barrett, who was the presenter on the Y Files, and he was also a radio presenter. He had his own run-in with the MOD and UFOs because he was talking one night on the, uh, the air about a UFO encounter and they were phoned through and told that there was a D notice placed on it and that they weren't to continue to talk about this on the air. And he said that he had a copy of the D notice and he was quite, um, quite vocal about telling people that the Ministry of Defence were actually telling people in the media that they weren't allowed to talk about certain things. So, you know, because of that, he became very vocal and he wanted to sort of do a TV programme, the Y files and various other things. So, uh, yeah, I used to do work with him. So it was magazines, television stuff. Um, you may have seen me in this same shirt <laughs> here. 
Yeah, this is my I'm doing a lecture or TV program shirt. You know, it doesn't, I don't wear it any other time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, with Tony Robinson, Baldrick, you know, from uh, Blackadder and now Time Team, which you're probably all familiar with. Uh, he came along to the Barge Inn to talk about crop circles. So I'll give you a little bit of an insight into that. But um, the main part of the talk this evening is going to be about RAF Redlow Manor and the Caution Computer Centre and other secret bases like this that had an investigation role with UFOs. So, am I standing in the way? Can you st you're okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, right, this place by here, you can see it's a bunker. It's a grassy verge bunker. We'll see a bit more of it in a minute um, with the steps going down. And I took this photo because, believe it or not, this is out in a leafy lane out in the middle of the countryside. It's near a military base, but it's not on the military base. It's off the military base. And you can actually just go along the road, walk down this lane. There's a gate. It doesn't say military base. There's a little yellow exclamation mark, which doesn't really say very much, but it doesn't say keep out. And you can pull the bar back and you can walk in and then you can walk down the, the steps there. And a couple of times we've done this, they've actually opened the doors for us by mistake. Um, but I think they've, they've got a little bit more uh, clued up on it now. But I mean, a few of us walking down there with a TV camera by, by the side and they actually opened the doors and we went in with a crew from an American television program, uh, Sightings. I don't know if you remember that one, Sightings. It's not shown so much anymore. Um, but anyway, we went down and uh, got in so far and then they came and took us out. So this is an underground base. It's uh, a command and control center for launch of nuclear missiles, amongst other things. So it's very sensitive, but you wouldn't imagine that they would just put it out in the middle of a, you know, area where people can just walk in with no sign saying keep out. And the only time you'll get told to leave is when you actually get too close. So it's kind of an interesting place, but uh, also interesting, these bases around uh, the Corsham Computer Center, the CCC, that's what it stands for, Corsham Computer Center, um, RAF Rudlow Manor, which is next to this, uh, this place, a bit further down the road, they used to investigate UFOs and they would send out officers from the base to interview the witnesses. And on occasion, these officers would ask people to not talk about their sightings. So, if you follow that agents coming out of a base, going up to UFO witnesses and telling them not to talk about it, that's kind of the criteria um, one extra criteria might be that they might look a bit weird and might get into a strange American car and then disappear. But this is kind of like a, a sort of a description of the men in black scenario, but official men in black rather than alien men in black. So um, I'll, I'll talk about how they actually used to operate out of RAF for Edlow Manor. So before we get there, I'll give you a bit of background. Um, after my uh, UFO days where I was a well-known UFO investigator. Um, I went down to Wiltshire and I encountered the crop circle subject which surprisingly as I say I had books on all sorts of paranormal things and yet crop circles was something that had just completely escaped me. I didn't know about this subject and, and when I must have been reading these books it was in them but when I was reading it, it's like oh strange marks in a crop I must have thought, well, that's a bit boring. What the hell is that about? And I just sort of skipped it, not interesting, you know. Let's have a look at ghosts or UFOs and things like that. You know, marks in a field, no, nah, not my thing. Little would I know that, you know, uh, 10 or so years later, I'd actually be one of the guys making them. So um, that's me uh, taken by a newspaper photographer. Um, and it was taken after I was arrested. because so I hold the... Uh, <laughs> The, the title of being the only person to ever be arrested for making crop circles. Um, and some people would say that that qualifies you as a failure because if you get arrested, then you're not a very good circle maker because to be a good circle maker, you make circles and don't get arrested. So I'll stick my hand in the air and say, yeah, I must be a really rubbish circle maker because I got arrested. But it might have something to do with the fact that being a UFO investigator prior to making crop circles, I felt compelled to tell people who were researching this subject, or allegedly researching this subject, we'll get into, into that a bit more, um, I felt compelled to tell them why I was doing it and to try and bring them on board with, you know, why people make crop circles. And it was that honesty which got me in trouble. 
because people just pushed and pushed for more and more proof until I gave them the proof I was going out to make a crop circle on a particular night and they just passed the information on to the police and they said, Are you, did you do this? And I, I was like, I was quite angry because I was betrayed by some of the people that I'd given this information to who were supposed to be, you know, waiting to see what the crop circle looked like but couldn't be bothered. They wanted to get me arrested instead. Um, well, uh, when the police came to the door, 16 police officers for me, 16 police, police officers, yeah, and turned the house upside down. Um, you know, they said to me, the first thing they said was, um, you Matthew Williams, yes. Did you make a crop circle? Have you provided information to say you made a crop circle? And I just thought, we haven't got, haven't got any children in the audience, have we? And because of the people that I was dealing with, I just thought, you bastards. <laughs> You bastards, you've betrayed me, you know? And I just thought, okay, yeah, yeah, fine. That was me, yeah. Because I thought, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna push this, then I will admit to it and I will say why I've been doing this. Because up to that point, it was, it was very much undercover. Not many people knew that I was actually making, making the crop circles. Oops, I don't think I have this one recording. Doesn't matter too much, but I'll just set it recording now. There we are. So, that was my uh, involvement in crop circles, but why did I do it? Everybody kind of thinks that, you know, I fell off the, the, the sort of, fell off the, the apple cart when I started talking about crop circles and making crop circles. But I mean, the reason I got involved was to see whether or not it could be done, and it was an experiment to see whether or not the, the circles I made would be taken as being the real thing by people that were researching them. So that was my start in it. And I found out, uh, somebody's, gonna, somebody's got a question. I'll, I'll, sh shall I just finish this paragraph and then, yeah. Okay, um, basically, because I'll forget where I am otherwise, um, and I'm forgetting it almost as we speak. So yes, uh, the, uh, the reason I started making crop circles was to, you know, first to test out whether they could be done, to see whether or not people um, would actually believe what, what we'd created was um, the real thing, and they did, and they loved what we'd created, and they said, yes, yes, couldn't be made by humans, you know, definitely alien. And some of it wasn't even very impressive, you know, to look at from a design point of view, but on the ground, the actual way that we laid it out was actually a bit more interesting. But what happened to me, and I will come to you in a second, what happened to us was strange things started happening. And whilst we were making the crop circles, other people were saying they were being healed and having strange effects in the crop circles we'd made, and we were having strange effects too. And I'm gonna come on to some of that uh, in a minute, but um, uh, if you wanna have a look at why I did it and go into it in great depth, um, what you'll learn if you go and watch my show Circle Makers TV or you go and visit my channel is, you, is you'll... <laughs> I've got a very bad, uh, bad uh, language problem, as in I like to swear a lot. I'm being very polite tonight, but on my YouTube channel it's no holes barred and, you know, every expletive under the sun. But it's, um, it's just the way I, I like to present things. So I warn you, okay, if you go and have a look at that, then it's me, no holes barred, not being the polite sort of lecturer I am tonight with you. But um, go and enjoy it. It's 72 hours of the show and interviews with circle makers and asking why we do it and what strange experiences we've had and paranormal things. So go and have a look at that. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll take a quick question then, if you, very quick. Relating to the stitch up or whatever you like to call it. Yeah. What proof did you actually have? Did you find the person or the group that stitched you up? I know who I know who actually did it. Um, the the person who did it was called um, Whitley Stryber, which some of you may be familiar. Um, he is. Yes, he's an author from the United States, and he he actually did. Oh, forget it. He did the, um, the book Communion, which has the grey alien face on the cover. So that's Whitley Stryber, and he, he does a radio show. And this radio show is all connected with UFOs, crop circles, weird stuff. And uh, one of his guests was a guy called Professor Michael Glickman. 
and I was doing research into the pros and cons of crop circles and I found out that there were a number of people who were lying to the public about things. Professor Glickman wasn't a professor. He lied about that. Okay? He doesn't have a professor title. And I brought this out and kept banging the table until a lot of researchers took it seriously. And then he stopped using the title professor. So I was right about this, you know. So I mean, I still maintain what I believe to be a, you know, credible investigative sort of slant on how I do things. But um, I've ruffled so many feathers in the crop circle community because it's almost like a little bit of a cult where people want it to be the aliens and they feel happier, you know, finding out it's aliens. They don't want it to be humans. And I can, I could cite Circle Makers TV as a classic example. Go and have a look at. Some of, some of those shows and have a look how many views there are. Okay, there's not many views. Okay, and yet, yet if you go to a video that says, you know, I met a player, Dean, and he showed me him making a crop circle with the UFO, that'll have 100,000 or a million views. But Circle Makers TV has been out there for a few years and it's, it's candid interviews with the people who made them explanations for things that people say can't be done, you know, giving the, the real reasons, but it's not popular. And it's, it's very interesting, I found out, you know, that realistically, you know, people don't want to hear that this stuff is done by people. So to a certain extent, um, I and others, although we've made it public what we're doing, and I got arrested for it, um, and I know it was Whitley Stryber with Michael Glickman that, um, that actually passed the information on to the police, um, it was Whitley Stryber, I'll do it very quickly, uh, I said to him, you've got this guy on your show who's lied about his credentials, um, would you like to know more about it? And he said, yes, yes, I'd love to know more about it. And I said, well, you know, what would you like to know? And he said, well, if you say you make these things, you'd have to prove it to me. And I said, I will, but you've got to keep it secret and you've got to let all these researchers kind of say what they believe about that circle, come out with their theories about it and then you'll know the truth because you knew in advance that I was going to do it and he said yeah yeah absolutely so it was Whitley Stryber who rang Michael Glickman and said hey there's this guy going to make a crop circle he's going to do it this evening and don't be fooled by it and and you know that's how it all happened so that's how I got arrested um, but yeah we know exactly who it was and, and Glickman was quite uh, pleased to have got me arrested as well but oh well well, I did prove he was lying about being a professor and he got me back by <laughs> getting me arrested. Um, but this is the sort of stuff I wanted to really impress upon because I can talk all night about the politics of crop circles and it gets a bit boring um, unless you're into that sort of thing. And it can, it can be a bit of a downer too. Uh, it's not what people want to hear. This is what people want to hear. And this is the real stuff behind why I make crop circles and why I continue to do it. Two teams in the same field on the same night working. One team was up here. If this is the snake, one team would sort of be up here doing that. And both teams didn't know the other team was there. And they were working close to each other on elongated formations. So elongated, OK, you know. You could say yay and nay, whether that's a coincidence. What about this? This was made by a team that were an experienced uh, circle making team, but when nobody knew who was doing, who did this one. And this was done miles away near uh, Warminster. And it took about three years and eventually, magically, a lot of things synchronistically happened to me. And uh, I was driving my car saw some guys paragliding and they looked like they were coming down into a field. Turns out, got chatting to them, I said, would you like a lift, basically? I, I stopped the car and I said, would you like a lift? Because when you're paragliding, you'll often come down very far from where you took off. And they said, yes. So I said, I'm a pilot. We got chatting about that. And uh, um, you know, then it got on to, what do you do? Crop circles. And they said, oh, we made our first crop circle. I said, really? Which one? And they said, oh, two spirals. And I said, oh, really? Why would you make those spirals? Because I thought they could just be saying it, you know, what, what evidence is there? What sort of story is to back it up? And they said, which made perfect sense to me, they take off from the hill, which is near where this appeared. And when they thermal, they thermal one way and then they could find another thermal and then they thermal the, the other way. So they alternate the way that they go. So it's like a spiral. They'd never made a crop circle before. This appeared on the same night as that 
happened to be my birthday, believe it or not, <laughs> in 2011, on the, on the night of my birthday. Um, and would you agree with me if, uh, that the coincidence between two designs like that appearing in one night would be like winning the lottery? And people keep winning the lottery with this sort of stuff happening in crop circles. They keep on getting coincidences whereby they think they've done a design and they think, yeah, great, my design, I'll go out and do that. And they find out somebody else has done something very similar in a different part of the countryside. And this happens again and again and again. So this is the type of stuff that um, I get interested by. And also some strange experiences that have happened to me in Wiltshire. There's a hill called Adam's Grave, which is this little sort of nipple type um, uh, affair. It's actually a hill fort. So that's just like the top of the hill fort. It goes around and you've got the white horse in Alton Barnes is sort of around here on the other side of the hill. And one night I saw some strange figures up there and they looked like they were dancing. And uh, I got my, my night vision out and I got my binoculars out. I was watching them for 10, 15 minutes. And then something strange happened because they shrunk down to the size of children as I was looking at them. And I thought, my God, what the hell's going on? Because they'd shrunk down. So I ran up to the top of the hill. And as you can see, you're on a very, uh, you're on a very high vantage point where you can see anyone that would have come up or down the hill and it was a very calm night. And when I got to the top of the hill, there was nobody up there. There were, weren't the figures up there and there was nobody leaving or coming to that point. So I believe that I witnessed something which maybe wanted to attract me to come up the hill. I don't know, but it did. And what I experienced was the wonderment of a moonlit night. And I could see very clearly along the valley. And I thought, yeah, this is a great place. It's a wonderful place to just be up here on a, on a warm summer's evening looking out and experiencing what people have experienced probably for you know time immemorial on that exact location the wonderment of what i was looking at that valley the experience and i think i was drawn up there for that for that experience but um yeah um, we got chased out of a field one night by balls of light um i i'm skipping a lot of stuff by um, getting to this point by not uh, going into the details of all the experiences. So I'll just sum it up by saying uh, at this point, I was a big believer in the coincidences. So like the spirals, the telepathy, I'd have had many events which had um, said, if you go with the feelings that it's OK to do something, it goes well. And if you go against the feeling you've got inside to do something, and you go against it, things go awry. And this happened a number of times to us when we were making crop circles. Sometimes you could go out and you'd, you'd just felt guided and you'd make amazing designs and they would all be perfect. And other nights when you felt like it wasn't quite right, you couldn't even start making a, a small circle with a group of people. And everybody was kind of, everybody would be like, don't know what I'm doing, don't know where I'm standing, can't work, work, work. And it's like your, your brain gets scrambled. So if you go against the feelings of whether you should or shouldn't be doing it, um, then things can happen. And on the, one of the nights when I was getting a feeling that we weren't meant to be there, and I just felt, no, I'm going to push through this. It's just my imagination. No, no, carry on. And we got out to the field and we were just about to start making the first circle and three balls of light came on at corners of the field. And we initially thought it must be the farmers. So we ducked down, that's the initial, you know, always your reaction, if a car headlights or a torch or anything, you know, just duck down. And um, well, when we, uh, when we could, we ran towards the preset direction we'd said we'd meet if we had any problems. We always set a point We'll meet there if we get split up or something happens. So we all ran towards this point, which just happened to be the, the one section of the field, because three corners of the field were covered by lights, and one corner of the field didn't have a light. And that was where we said we were going to go. So we all ran to that point, And then we walked along the road and got back to where we were, um, got the car, and went home. Uh, Somebody else had another experience. They were hanging back by the boards and they said they heard terrible noises and screaming and all sorts of things happening nearby. 
And when we, when we got the car and we drove back to pick this chap up, he was walking up the road with the boards in his hand. And we thought this was crazy. You know, it, it is crazy because, I mean, we could have been the police. He didn't know our headlights from anybody else. And we were just drove straight towards him. And he was white as a white as a sheet. And we said, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, get me in the car, get me in the car. And we got him in and he said, no, there was something there. And it was screaming and making noises. So all of this happened on this night where we saw these balls of light that uh, seemingly moved us out of this field, chased us out of this field. And I think we were being um, given the impression not to do something there because two weeks later, there was an absolutely spectacular circle that appeared on that spot. And I think that we, we weren't meant to do that because what we had planned was kind of basic and wasn't really meant to be there. And whoever did the really clever one, that was meant to be there. And I think we were just like ushered out of the way. So, you know, I've, I've gone from being a, a bit skeptical as a, as a youth to, to full, full circle on this sort of thing. Um, I've even had UFO experiences such as this, uh, such as this um, disc that was hovering above the veil of Pusey, actually above Pusey itself. If you, if you can uh, imagine the village of Pusey would have been beneath this at the, at, the, um, at the same width of the UFO. So it's actually very large. If you imagine a village, the width of a village, and a ball of light, a ball of light which was being chased by a military helicopter. It's been talked about on the, on the channel if you want to go and have a look at uh, some of these stories. Ball of light being chased by a military helicopter went off into the distance, we were filming it and discussing it back and forth, and uh, we watched it go up over the, village, the veil of, uh, uh, sorry, the, the town of Pusey, or the village of Pusey, and it went up, and then it shot up into the, into the disc, and the disc went straight up into the clouds and was gone at high speed. So we watched that, two of us. Uh, strangely enough, um, we were doing a reenactment for Japanese television. They came along, they were asking people about experiences. We did a reenactment. And uh, laser pointers is, uh, come into play here. Um, Stephen Greer, uh, some of you may be familiar with his uh, disclosure project that he does, where he got uh, um, many members of the American military and uh, government to talk about their UFO experiences working inside the military, things they'd seen. Well, that chap, he was putting on a Skywatch in Wiltshire, and the, uh, one of the organisers, a guy called Simeon Hine, uh, who's a doctor, um, was there, and they were playing around with laser pointers, and I'd seen this. Uh, we were then asked to do a reenactment for Japanese television uh, of this event, and whilst we were there, this chap, Simeon Hine, walked down to see what we were doing, because they could see from the hill where they were doing their event, they could see us setting up with cameras and things like this. So he came down, he said, what's going on? And we said, well, we had a UFO sighting and we're, we're just interested in reenacting it for the, for the guys here. And he said, okay. And I said, you're with Stephen Greer? Yeah, yeah. You guys have got the laser pointers. And this was back in the days, you know, when nobody had laser pointers. They, this would have cost like 2,000 pounds. That's what he paid for his laser pointer you know, back, in the, back in the day. And um, I said, you've got the laser pointer? Yeah. Have you got it with you? Yeah, I do actually. And I'm like, oh my God, can I like touch it? Wow, you know. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And I said, would it, would it like, you know, hit the clouds over there if I shone it at the clouds? And he says, yeah, sure, try. And I'm like, okay. So I shone it at the clouds, and the cloud went boof, 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 and ex like an explosion of light came out of the cloud, and three balls of light came out. One spiraled, one uh, went in a straight line, and one zigzagged. And they went Ooh, off in three different directions. And we were like, oh my God, oh my God. And we were shouting and we were saying to the Japanese producer, we were going, look, look. And he was going, my God, yeah, yeah. He was like, so we were saying, film it, film it, you know. And he used to say, like, you know, in Japanese to his crew, he was like, film, film, you know, da 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 da. And then we were like, whoa. So we're watching these things go off. And then all of a sudden, to the left of us, a military helicopter, which must have been hovering there the whole time, which is impossible, because I don't know how a military helicopter can hover uh, probably about two or three distances to the end of the room away from us, was hovering at that distance silently, just around the edge of a, a little sort of 
part of the hill and then just went no 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 and just popped up in front of us and we were like you can't start a, a helicopter engine that quick you can't move out that quick and I thought this was this was very interesting so we, we were sort of like oh my god you know look a helicopter as well so it was all this stuff was happening laser pointer just caused the the cloud to kind of like erupt into into light and um, we said did you film it and the Japanese producer said to these guys and he went oh no 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 we were like what and he goes oh no they, they were filming our faces they were filming our faces they thought we were doing a reenactment and we were like oh you just they just missed something really good and he goes yeah but that Japanese producer brought his family back to Wiltshire and uh, you know he was uh, very much into uh, UFOs and things from that point onwards so yeah uh, that's a bit of a uh, zoom in on that I realize I'm probably gonna have to speed up so uh, we started at 10 past did we yeah 10 past okay so we got till 10 past so I'll try and speed it up right okay UFOs Zooming on from crop circles, we can we can talk about it more later if you wish. But zooming on, um, this is what I was doing before I made crop circles, and some some of what some of what I was doing whilst I was making crop circles was still being a UFO investigator. But um, we were doing document research at the Public Records Office in Kew in London, and we found a number of documents which nobody had ever seen before and they weren't filed where they were supposed to be filed. Now, I, I had a particular uh, idea of a way that I would like to do research, and it's like, if everybody's looked at these documents before, well, if we look at the same documents, we're gonna see what everybody else has seen before. So what we have to do is we have to look in places where people wouldn't be expecting to see UFO documents in case there's something there. And I thought, well, RAF Redlow Manor would be a good place, and I was looking for old names, for old bases that had changed names and things that had, you know, sort of... The military have this habit of changing names on bases quite a lot. And we'll come to that later on with uh, Port and Down, you'll see that one. And that changes it on a sort of like a yearly basis, it changes its name. But um, we found these documents in another file. And we thought, ooh, look at this, this is great. You know, we've got a document here, a few documents talking about uh, things which were, back, uh, back in the day, not known about. They're talked about now as being real things, but back in the day they were only rumoured. Things like DI-55, Defence Intelligence 55. Um, but anyway, the Provost and Security Service, which was then based in Bromyard Avenue in Acton, um, Provost and Security Service means basically the police force for the RAF, so they call them the Provost. Um, so they were investigating UFOs and sending out officers to interview witnesses. So we've got, and we've got two things now. We've got the fact that we've got the Provost and Security Service involved in doing UFO investigations when we were always told that it was just the uh, office of Nick Pope and his, uh, his, his sort of predecessors that had uh, gone, well, basically they were the guys that just wrote the letters back to members of the public saying no defense significance, not interested. But here we had a document which clearly stated that you had Provost and Security Service sending out officers, officers to interview the witnesses. And uh, this was uh, staff in confidence and confidential. And some of these documents that we had as well were top secret. So uh, we thought, well, you know, we've got gold dust here. So we took copies of them. We took them away. And uh, we started showing them to various ufologists. And they thought, well, OK, uh, we need to get a copy of these documents to prove they're real. So they started requesting the documents from the Public Records Office. And they were told, no, there's no such document. It, it's, it's not there. And uh, they were also told that um, some of the documents that we'd uh, uh, mentioned um, had been misfiled or were missing. They couldn't say where they were. Um, of course, if there was no proof that these documents existed, somebody could actually t say legitimately to us that we might have falsified them, we might have created them. So it wasn't a very good situation for us to be in because we were actually showing the reality of there being these higher departments from a place where we found in, in other documents where they weren't supposed to be UFO files. And now we had people questioning whether or not we were telling the truth. So I got a bit, um, I got a bit peeved by this, and I actually uh, made some phone calls. 
uh, pretending to be from the Ministry of Defence. I actually knew a little bit about the um, government telephone network. I used to work for Customs and Excise, and I, I did actually train as a telephone operator to, to relieve the um, operator during lunch hours, you know, so I used to sit in for a... But they sent me on a training course, and I knew a few things about the operations of um, the switchboard that we had, and we had a complicated switchboard where you could intercept calls and do things like that. And I knew about that, and I also knew a little, a few other things as well that kind of worked out from my time being there. And I knew a way to, to basically hack into the military or government tele telephone network from outside and appear that you, you were like a government call. Because I don't know if you know, but know this, but when, when, they sort of, when you ring up from outside, if you're ringing a government office, if you're internal, the phone will ring differently. And if you're an external call from a member of the public, it'll ring differently. And if you're a, a military call, it'll ring differently again. So there are different calls to signify who's making, a, making the phone call in. What I did is I entered the telecommunications network from outside. I then used the number system, which is obviously to ring the different departments, and I rang Q. And I said, oh, I'm ringing you from uh, MOD document department in London. Um, we're just ringing regarding this document that um, we were asking questions in the Houses of Parliament at the time, by the way. So I'm ringing about the, the document that they're asking the questions about in Parliament. Um, uh, where is it at the moment? I just put it down. Where is the document at the moment? Um, because our system is down. Um, have, you got, have you got it up there? And they said, oh, yes, yes, uh, yeah, I'll have a look now. Uh, it's with, like, Wing Commander, blah, blah, blah. Really? When was it there? Oh, it was there on this date. Oh, OK. Has he had it, has he had it long? Where was it before that? And I had a list of where this document had been. And we'd been asking questions in Parliament and been told that this document was missing, that it had gone. So these are official answers which had been given by uh, MOD representatives in the Houses of Parliament from an MP's question. And we, we basically, through my naughtiness doing it that way, we found out that they knew exactly where the document was and they'd been lying all along because the document had been doing the rounds inside the MOD. So, um, Yai and Wynne Jones, I'll, I'll just skip on a little bit here. So, right, this is the government buildings at Acton. This is where the HQ Provost and Security Services used to be based. Uh, that's about 1923 when that building was, was created. And there it is today. Okay, we'll come on to some other files here. This is some of the other file stuff that we, uh, we had. Um, so, Yian Wynne Jones, I have got a picture of him which will come up in a minute. Uh, he, well, actually, let's go to it now. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Uh, there we are, Yian Wynne Jones. Um, he was asking the questions, and when he found out that he'd been lied to, he went back in and he said, um, Do you have any developments on the, the, the whereabouts of the file? because he'd already been told it was lost. And they said, no, no, we have no developments. And he said, well, I must say, I'm very disappointed because I feel that I've been lied to by this house. And it's quite a stark thing to say in, in the Houses of Parliament. I've been lied to. You know exactly where this document is. And um, basically, he, he gave them details of where it was. And, uh, and they, they said, oh, well, well, we'll come back to you very quickly then. And within two days, that document was back in the Public Records Office uh, for everybody to see. And that document, to this day, um, is, it contains pretty much the, the missing link of what was going on in the MOD, i.e. the secret departments that worked above the level of Nick Pope. I assume you all know who Nick Pope is? Nick Pope, right, hang on. Mm. If anybody doesn't know, Nick Pope was the guy who used to write the letters back to members of the public. So if you said you had a sighting, he was the guy who usually said, oh, it's probably just, you know, just... Venus or whatever, no defence significance. He's even written books about the subject. Now, I quite like Nick, even though I thought at the time that he was playing a role and there was probably a lot more going on behind the scenes that he wasn't allowed to talk about, we couldn't prove it. Well, some of these documents actually started to make a lot more sense that there were departments above Nick that he used to liaise with that he wasn't allowed to talk about. And as I said, they were named DI-55, and we'll come back to some of this. Uh, so there was Yian Wynne Jones, Dr. Colin Ridyard as well, was one of the, the, the chaps involved in, in getting this parliamentary question stuff asked. And, um, 
a lot of that's been written about in the UFO magazine from the past. So that's some of the stuff I used to do. But some of the document um, information turned up these, uh, these names that had been rumoured about in books like Above Top Secret by Timothy Good. Defence Intelligence 55, DI-55. That's the biggie. DSTI, Department of Scientif Scientific and Technical Intelligence. PNSS, which is Provost and Security Service, which I've mentioned a little bit earlier on, Air Intelligence 5A, Air Intelligence 4B, DDI Tech, Department of Defense Intelligence Technical, and Air Secretariat 2A, which, does anybody recognize what Air Sec Secretariat 2A is? You've obviously never had a letter from them then. That, that's Nick Pope's old job, which is right at the bottom <laughs> of the list. These guys were really dealing with the stuff, and then they get the guy at the bottom to write to you telling, telling people that there's no defense significance. But OK, you know, that was Nick's role. He had to do that. But these documents started proving there was more going on. And down the line, um, I think it was only about two, two or three years ago, Nick Pope, for the very first time ever, admitted that I was right because I was the one that kept on to him about DI-55, and he actually admitted on Circle Makers TV, which is like, I wish he'd done it on some, like, you know, UFO documentary or something, but he did it on, on my channel, and basically he said, uh, yeah, you were right, DI-55 did exist, yep, and I used to report to them, and I used to be in and out of their offices all the time, and they were the guys that knew what was really going on and used to investigate it. And then I would kind of write to the, the members of the public. But I did have a much more important role than you think. It wasn't they weren't in charge. I was still kind of very important and doing things. But you are right. They were above me and they were kind of doing stuff. And I used to go and see them all the time. So that was interesting. I got an admission that changed a lot of stuff to do with UFO research. Uh, from Mr. Nick Pope, and yeah, so that was interesting. Um, this is uh, a book by Nick Redfern, who you saw earlier, a photo earlier on, and he was talking about uh, DI-55 in this, but uh, as I say, the actual admission from Nick Pope that he worked for DI-55 came after this book even. So it's quite new information, which I don't think has even made it into a book yet regarding Nick Pope. And I don't, it's not a lot of people actually mentioning it either. I mean, I've been sort of like, I've been sh shaking the tree and saying, guys, Nick's actually said DI-55 worked above him. You know, you need to be talking about this. And I'm not, I'm not hearing a lot about it. But um, right, uh, when you do stuff like I've been doing um, over the years on bases like Redlow Manor, and um, we'll come to Redlow Manor because we haven't seen any photos of it yet. Um, when you do stuff like that um, and you get questions asked in the Houses of Parliament and you then go hacking their phone system and embarrassing the Ministry of Defence in Parliament and you do all these sorts of things that I did, you can bet your bottom dollar that my phone was tapped, um, that I was being watched. <laughs> I was being watched. We, we saw them watching us a couple of times. Um, we actually sort of like we were in the window watching sort of people in a car, you know, sort of with a newspaper in the distance, and we were like taking photos and binoculars and things. And I said, "Well, he's been there long enough. Do you think he's really after us?" Well, there's one way to know. So we just went up in the window. We went like that, and all of a sudden he just put his newspaper down and just started the car and drove off. And it's like, you know, he'd been there for ages, but when we just went, hello, now, how did he even know we were in that window? And he was obviously was looking straight at where we were. So there were things like that happened, but there was being followed was uh, one of the awkward ones. And I mentioned uh, to Emlyn earlier on, um, if you want to lose your job, as I did, working for Customs and Excise, because it doesn't go down very well, you know, investigating UFOs and government bases and things like this and talking about it, um, when you're supposed to be working for, you know, s s a low-level government job, but still the government nonetheless, it doesn't go down well. I got my, um, I got my job taken away from me on some very, very uh, dodgy grounds. Um, I, very quickly, I'll tell you, I was asked to design a database, which I did, computer database. How do you start a database? You have to have an icon on your desktop. 
and you double click the icon the program starts great thank you very much for the program we're going to keep the program we like the program but the icon you never had permission to have to put that icon on your desktop that's a breach of departmental security you're sacked because of the icon but thanks for the database though now piss off yeah <laughs> so that was that in a nutshell that's what happened there um, then there was being followed coming over from uh, Wiltshire to Wales, coming back home um, and realising there was a police car way, way back and being a little bit kind of uh, surveillance sensitive because I you know, knew about customs and excise and the way they used to operate with cars and you know, following people and whatnot. I could see this car and I sped up and he sped up and I slowed down and he slowed down and this went on for an hour till I came over the Severn Bridge right into Wales onto the Mago services and I basically pulled in, got out, sat in the bonnet of my car just waiting for them to come and there they were, they came round and they just got straight out, came straight up to me and they said, uh, hello, uh, you know, are you the owner of this vehicle? I said, you know I am, yes. And they said, uh, what's your name then? Uh -huh. You know who I am? No, I don't know who you are. Yes, you do, because you've just been following me for an hour. It's just weird that you just like pull up to me right next to my car, isn't it? Like, you know, bang. And they're like, oh, so what's your name then? I said, well, you know my name. I'm not going to give you my name. You know what it is. And it's like, well, if you don't give us your name, you'll be arrested. Book em, Dano. <laughs> so that's what they did. They arrested me and uh, took me in. Mm. What do you think happened? I was told that I wasn't wearing my safety belt. That's why I was pulled over. This was the premise for why these people had been there. I said, but what about, the, what about following me all about, you know, from, from Wiltshire? Oh, I don't know anything about that. So I took it to court. What do you think happened from that event? Safety belt. What do you reckon? Any ideas what would happen if you're not wearing a safety belt? Fine. Two, three points. Banned for a year for driving. Banned for a year for driving. That's what happens when you, with the, mm, 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 mm. yeah, that's what happens. They let you know that they have the power and they can do what they like, like to you. So, you know, when you hear people say to you, you know, oh, Matt Williams is a government agent and, oh, you know, like Peter Paget's been doing recently, uh, come to him a bit later on. You know, he's a government agent, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, he's a government agent who's been shat on by government agents then. That's what, yeah, really. And I don't think they wanted this stuff out because it was quite embarrassing, you know? So anyway, if you want to read more about um, how I got followed and various things that happened to me and other people involved in these investigations, it's all in this book by Nick Redfern called On the Trail of the Saucer Spies. And uh, there's large elements of that book uh, devoted to the things that happened to me and various other people so it's very serious they do actually spy on people they do follow people around and it's all to do with this base RAF Redlow Manor it's one of the places as we saw they were sending out officers to interview witnesses and that um, that document I showed you earlier on I didn't actually go through it let's quickly go back right okay Right, this, this one here, it says that they basically sent out Sergeant J. Scott from Provost and Security Services to interview Miss Anne Henson, and her letter is in there and a diagram was included in the file. This file was sent up to other departments, they investigated it, it went up higher, and they made some conclusions. Now, one of the things they said, I'm not sure if we've got it here, um, one of the things they said in there, uh, investigation is that in addition to her sighting the uh, radar operators at West Frew basically picked up the objects on the screens of their radars at the same time so they ruled out because of the behavior of the way that this thing was showing up on the radar at the same time as it was being seen by Anne Henson they ruled out at the bottom it says I think it's somewhere down here that it wasn't possible that it could be um, just a, an imagination thing or a, uh, a light only, you know, like um, something that was basically observed, but, you know, visual. It was actually a confirmed radar sighting as well by the, by the Ministry of Defence and fully investigated. Uh, there we are, it's down the bottom here. Um, 
Mm -hmm. it, you know, it goes on to say another point which is being considered is that this type of radar can lock on to heavily charged clouds, <coughs> but clouds of this nature could go up to um, the heights in question and could cause abnorm abnorm abnormal large echoes on the radar screen. It is not thought, however, that this inc incident was due to such phenomena, so they ruled it out. So it's a genuine case, but they did actually s go out to see Anne Henson, this witness, and ask her not to talk about the sighting. So this is your classic men in black scenario. And where were they coming from? They were coming from RAF Provost and Security Services. Now they were based in Acton in 1960, but they moved to a place called Rudlow Manor, which is in Corsham, which is where I've got a big interest in. Uh, they moved there in the 80s and they kept working there up until about 1992. And then they moved to RAF Henlow. We'll more about that in a bit. but. Um, this place is interesting, uh, Caution, because it used to have an underground radar centre where they would plan uh, on boards where they were sending out aircraft and they would look on the radar screens and track things. And uh, basically, it was a command and control centre, which was, it was described as for the southern half of England. So they called it for the uh, HQ Southern Sector, it was called. So if there was anything like a UFO or something that was strange, uh, spotted in the skies or any reports that had come through these guys not only did they investigate and send out the officers they also had the people looking at the radar screens right where they were actually working it wasn't like they were dealing with Heathrow and they were working in Corsham these guys were working right next to the people who had the screens and doing the investigations very closely with you know those those experts that were operating that equipment so um, right we're going to take a slight uh, sideways, uh, sideways sort of turn here now, because DI-55, it used to be in a building in London called the Metropole. So if you look through the files, they often refer to, and Nick Pope refers to, the Metropole building in relation to um, DI-55. Now that actually got sold and um, it's now called the Corinthia Hotel. So I've got a little piece of video for you here, which, uh, which will explain a bit about um, how the Corinthia came to be. That's just a little bit about the, uh, the, the building which housed DI-55. Now it's interesting as well that after they left in 2006, um, that was when uh, Nick Pope was basically starting to loosen up on what he could talk about. So he waited until the building had been vacated before he was prepared to talk about it because we don't know where DI-55 are now situated. We don't know where they are. But the fact is that they didn't want people to start contacting them by just ringing them up at that building or turning up at the door and saying, we know you're in there, what are you doing? You know, What have you got with UFO documents? And they didn't want that happening. So I think a lot of this was timed. And indeed, my doing stuff at Rudlow Manor, I believe that a lot of what we did with publicizing some of the stuff at Rudlow Manor actually resulted in Rudlow Manor shutting down uh, completely the manor house and that section, moving it all across to another base, which is RAF Henlow. And a similar sort of situation here, DI-55, you know, they were, they were operating in this building quite happily. Uh, suddenly the documents come out and some embarrassing stuff that actually proves that where they where they sort of are names names where they uh, where they are and which departments they are and then it's on the record that they do exist and suddenly oh we're going to sell the building and get rid of it all and turn it back into sort of you know public space and get rid of it and the MOD have this habit of kind of moving stuff around if you find out where they're doing something very interesting they'll move it and they'll change its name so they may no, no longer be called DI-55. I would imagine they'll be called something else now because we know they're called DI-55. They have to change it. So anyway, just to give you a little insight into uh, the machinations of uh, how government stuff works. Uh, let's quickly move through. Uh, yeah, and this is some of the stuff you see at uh, Rudlow Manor. Um, this is the site two, which actually houses the uh, government bunker for the royal family, which some of you may have heard about. Uh, there's an entrance shaft way there. That's a, um, that's actually got elevator shafts, um, not elevators. What do they call them? Travelators. Uh, when you have, 
like going down escalators. Escalators, that's the word I'm looking for. This actually has escalators which were requisitioned from the uh, construction of London Underground and they were diverted across and used in this, this base. At its height, five to 6,000 people worked underground here as a, it was a bomb store, but it also had a section which was gonna be for the royal family to uh, live in if there was a, a need to go underground um, so they had a whole section and uh, you have breather shafts here and it's a huge area. I got, um, I got criticised quite greatly over the years for some of the things I've talked about with this base. Turns out that years down the line um, a naval commander went on television. It's on my channel, you can actually have a look at it. It's under a thing called Burlington. So if you want to look at, at uh, that's the code name for this bunker, it's called Burlington. Um, he actually came on and one of the things I've been saying for many years that it has 25 miles of underground tunnels and the naval commander is standing there in a lift with Channel 4 going down underground and he goes, yes, well, it's got about, um, uh, about 25 miles of uh, underground tunnels. Uh, to start with, how big is this underground complex? How many miles of tunnels are there here? Well, the whole site is 36 acres underground on this site, the, the naval store site here. And uh, there are tunnels which the, longest, the, the length of the site is about um, uh, three quarters of a mile long. And there are tunnels running in all directions. And out, out of that lot, there are a total of uh, somewhere in the region of 25 miles of tunnels. And it's like, ah! So Matt isn't a, a liar. Matt has been telling you this all this time and you've been going, no, 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 you just make this stuff up and there's, you know, naval commander actually saying that it was just how I said it was. But uh, yeah, I've done that a few times over the years. So let's have a quick look. Do we need to have our break? Yeah. Let's have the break then. Yeah, we'll come back to the bunker pictures and I'll show you a few things in there. So thanks very much for listening and hope, hopefully we'll see you after the break. So thanks. Right, I think we were out talking about um, this rather fuzzy photo. I have got better ones, but I, I rushed to get some of these earlier on. <laughs> He's my best friend there, look. Yeah. So um, here's uh, some breather, uh, breather shafts you can see going into the ground. Uh, this is a lift shaft there, and you can drive vehicles into that and then take them down underground. Uh, this is an escalator uh, sort of slope shaft and it starts there and, and just goes down at a an angle into the ground as i say five to six thousand people working underground in secrecy when this was a bomb uh, munitions base but it also had a lot of other features too so this is uh, the air shaft i was telling you that's closer up this is the lift shaft and there's lots of things like this this isn't the only lift shaft there are lots of them around the place but it's just an easy one to to spot so uh, that's me taking people on uh, little trips underground because there are some parts of this uh, this base which can still be accessed um, via the quarry tunnels because it was all basically quarried out for the bath stone which they made the uh, city of bath from it's that uh, creamy colored stone very uh, easy to to uh, to chisel and um, it left behind all these tunnels, which eventually they turned into the underground bomb, uh, bomb storage place and also the royal family and the radar center underground and also the command of the Def defense communications network, the CDCN, uh, that is based there, that communicates with the satellites and we'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. But um, lots of different things and underground, you, 
people leave graffiti in some of these tunnels and uh, you can often see alien faces and things like that. So um, I wonder if anybody knows the stories about the UFO connection with the base. That's me on the right. And people even have a little joke. They've made, uh, made these figures um, which, which appear to be holding guns. But uh, it, they've been reconfigured at times, so they look like Daleks. People maneuver the bricks around, so they make different things. People, Daleks, and so every time you go down, you have a new little experience. It seems like uh, somebody's, somebody's having a bit of fun. But um, uh, I also got into some of the more active bases uh, without permission and uh, set off some alarms by uh, going in on occasions. And uh, we had to, we, we actually jumped over fences at uh, one base, uh, set off alarms on the way in, and we heard gunshots. And, and when we left later on, many hours later, we hid in boxes. And uh, we stayed there whilst we heard people walking around and heard noises and things. And we stayed there for hours in the cold. And uh, when, we, when it all got quiet again, we came out and we actually walked to an emergency stairway going to the ground and right at the top there were little um, movement sensors for alarms like you get in your house so we realized if we got any further we'd set them off so you know we kind of prepared ourselves and we, we knew there were no noises we very carefully and quietly walked around and made sure there was no noises the base had gone quiet again so we assumed they probably thought that we'd set off the alarms by accident you know that sort of the alarms had set themselves off by accident and that there wasn't anybody there. Once they were satisfied that it was an accident, there wasn't anyone in there, they'd all gone away. But we knew that if we, if we kicked this door open, there were probably um, magnet sensors on the door and also the movement sensors would have picked us up. So we knew that we'd have to make a rush for the fence. So we were prepared for whatever would happen. So we, that's what we did. We kicked the door open, alarms went off again, and then we heard guns firing again and it was like oh my god you know so we got to the fence and very um filled with adrenaline at this point climb over the fence which had barbs at the top and managed to get over those and jumped and then twisted my leg on the way way down and uh got out um, my mate had to sort of help me get across the field we had a lot of cows um sort of came up behind us which uh, he thought they were gonna um basically uh trample us and I said no no they're good because you know they can't shoot us through the cows <laughs> you know so that's good we get out but it was all just to get photos really that the underground bases existed and uh, that they were still in use which is what all this was about so there's some of these photos um, and roadways you can see that you can drive down and the lights were on we didn't turn them on you know these these were areas where there weren't any bits stored but there were other places which um, I've got photos of where you can see lots of stuff stored. Um, subsequently we were actually invited to go back to that very same base and go and have a tour by the people who at the base because they said that they didn't shoot guns and they wanted to they wanted to let us know that they weren't shooting guns at us and so let us you know come and have a guided tour. So we went for the guided tour and that was fair enough and they let us film as well. Um, so interesting this is the manor house which is now disused it's apparently been sold to an international uh, consortium that haven't done anything with it but it's been sold to some international concern sounds like that might just be a, a front basically for an excuse why they're not um, doing anything with this building we we suspect that there is still something underneath the building they they say that um, there aren't any tunnels underneath this building. We've heard contrary to that, but um, they've been very good with us in many respects because they've allowed us to take photos on the surface of the disused part of the base. But um, that wasn't the military that allowed us to do that. That was the security that now look after it. This is underground um, air breather shafts which go on for thousands of feet, you know, it, from various uh, areas to feed air into the underground systems before they become grilled off and uh, gated off so you can't go in the, into the actual military tunnels but these are the old bathstone quarry tunnels so oops right that's the caution computer center i've told you about the um, entrance way and how it's situated in the countryside let's uh, outside it um, you've got fire action cards i've actually opened up that little red thing and had a read 
and it tells you about going down underground and what the fire brigade should be expected to do and who they should report to if there's a fire the fire brigade should report to blah so it explains it this is the gate i told you about which is unlocked it used to be unlocked now i think they do actually have a keypad on here and it still doesn't say keep out but there's a keypad so this won't just open so you can't get into the foyer but it just has this little exclamation sign that's the only thing saying keep out of the whole place and that's a nuclear command and control facility for uh, trident nuclear submarines i'm told we've had many lies told to us about what these bases are and what they do they said it was a document storage facility we said well, if it's a document storage facility why isn't it on the on the surface you know they don't keep supercomputers um, on rubber mounted floors just to keep documents you know you can do that in a in a server center on the ground um, anyway so our unwanted visit i've taken people there including tv crews a few times we've had a bit of fun so let's uh, show you one of the one of the things we did i got a funny feeling they haven't clocked us yet because that camera isn't watching us yeah. <laughs> Tracy goes. Keep on the uh, Here we go. Tracy here, muddy. <laughs> Good deal. Okay, I want your first impressions. What do you think of what you're just about to see? Ah, nice cloud. <laughs> With is that <laughs> what I would like Why to know is surrounded by barbed wire fence. Is this non operational? No. The opposite. Yeah, those Is there anyone in the van? No, yeah, Jamie's in there. No, oh no. Where are the keys though? Andy. <laughs> right, open the gate and walk down into the foyer. <laughs> no, 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 this is... No, no, it's... It's great. No smoking, so I'll put the cigarette there. Bombs alert. Yeah, we've come to see what, what we're doing here. We're, we're with the uh, alien acknowledgement campaign and we're interested in information about uh, the underground bunker system and whether you actually have exotic technology stored away down there. Hello? Can you give us any information about that? Can Mr. Howley or Mr. Hosking tell us anything about uh, extraterrestrials underground here? <laughs> we, can we see somebody in charge? We've been led to believe that uh, you're keeping extraterrestrials uh, at this place against their will. So. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> you know, so we want to talk to somebody in charge because, you know, this is uh, not a good way of representation, is it? You know? Yeah, we'd like to speak to someone in charge. Carl Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Thanks. Pensive faces. Command the control facility. Well, if any of you got any questions, just now's the time to put it forward. <laughs> you know, really, really. We 
This is a people who, you know, so I want to suggest I might tell you anything. Yeah, just feel free to question. don't know me, okay? You're in charge, you guys. Do you mind uh, leaving, please? Because oh. you're not expecting now. Oh. It's a bit of a shame. Hello. You might get some answers. Hiya. Right, so, uh, can I ask what you were doing then? Well, like I said, we're with the Alien Acknowledgement Campaign. No, I, mean, like it's no, it's I mean, uh, there are a number of right. certain to uh, look into mm -hmm. this. Matthew Williams. Mm -hmm. Timothy Good. Well, Matthew Williams, yeah. Matthew <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought you'd get cheesed off with coming down here. I you love get, it. You get oiked off so, so often now. We've oh. taken we've taken these guys on it. They'll give you a pass in there, you've been so often. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I don't know why they didn't open it up, you know, it could be a good tourist attraction. It could be. <laughs> it could be. Okay. No, well, if I turn this off now, do you promise not to beat us up? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like so they just ask us to leave. But there we are, just a little... Uh, <laughs> A little taste of what it's um, like to go there. I've told you the story about being followed from Corsham to Wales and what happened to me and how I lost my driving license because of it. Um, and that was because you know I was doing things like that and publicising a lot of what the base didn't want talked about. Um, they were obviously doing things like this where you get um, RAF would be scrambled to look at uh, UFOs. And, of course, all these reports would have to go back to a chain of command, so they would be sent to <laughs> different departments that would look at the, the file before it would be, you know, concluded. Um, so one of the places that would be in the list would have been HQ Provost and Security, PNSS Provost and Security Service, which was based at Rudlow Manor, as we said. So, um, right, so this is a little treat, because, as I said, I did get permission. Oh, that's... Um, I've got to press play on this one. Um, I did get permission to uh, take some photos with my drone. So we'll just have a quick look at that. So this is the original guardhouse entrance. I, I came there once and I was chatting to somebody earlier on about this and I had guns pointed at my head in my, in my car. My friend and me, we had guns pointed at us and that was the point the guardhouse entrance way to the base. So we drove in off the main road and we were asking them about UFOs and um, yeah, they weren't, they weren't too pleased at us being there. So uh, had the guns pointed at us till they could identify who we were. They were quite interested by the fact that I worked for Customs and Excise at the time. And I'm sure that went back to my employers and probably did have a lot to do with why I got sacked, but not for the reasons that I really got sacked. For, you know trumped up sort of reasons this is the old manor house um, there's a barn here which uh, has a dance floor apparently uh, that's uh, um, there's a building that's been demolished which was to do with the um, security it was quite a large building down the side that's gone uh, but apparently there might be some underground tunnels here um, they're redeveloping part of the site as you can see these are brand new houses here which are uh, taking up a little bit of the area and um, I'll sit down because my knee will be a bit easier. Right, this is the what we call site one part of the base. And over here in this building is the uh, record store, which was where the records of UFO sightings would have been kept. We've managed to determine that this is the place. Um, it was called a registry, and it was to do with a flying complaints flight. Uh, flying complaints flight were the people inside Provost and Security Service who used to do the investigations and that was the building where all the files were kept apparently but it's all disused now it's all shut down I wonder how much we had to do with uh, it actually being shut down I uh, don't know what some of these other buildings are that is a recreational center so there's a like a dance floor and a bar in there um, but just to give you an idea, there's more of this video stuff on the internet, so you can have a look at it in, in detail. You know, our office's mess. So just to speed up, I will move on. We can have a look at some other base stuff in a, in a second. So this is um, the Royal Air Force Henlow, which is where the Provost and Security Service apparently moved all their operations to this base. Um, now this is apparently up for sale. So surprise, surprise, that's RAF Henlow from the air. Nothing peculiar about that per se, but um, 
ITV News 2016, they're going to sell off bits of Henlow now. So it seems like with the military, everything is always on the move and nothing ever seems to sort of stay in one place for too long, especially if it's a hot potato. They keep moving them around. But anyway, there we are. So uh, another alien in another part of the base, just to show you that there's lots of aliens being daubed on the walls underground, and it wasn't me that did it. So um, in relation to uh, places that have investigated UFOs and have a secrecy role, this is one of the places. Um, but I'm just wondering if anybody knows where it is. I'm just going to give a bit of a clue. You know, it's a secret place, but uh, any ideas? London. It's definitely London, that's the Thames. Yeah, you got one of them. T pick, pick and Which one do you reckon? Well, uh, five. Because it's the one nobody, <laughs> nobody gets right. It's the MI5 one. Everybody is used to that one, which is the MI6 building. That is the, uh, the James Bond MI6 kind of... Um, uh, it's been used in the movies where they blew it up, you know. But MI5, which is the one that actually looks internally inside the country at, at British nationals, MI5, internal security service. Um, MI6 is the external security service, so that's the one that deals with the world. So this is the foreign spies would come out of that one. And then you've got this place. You should all know what that is. GCHQ, GCHQ yeah. The donut ring, yeah. Um, it's not all that big, really, when you look at it. I mean, look at the cars here compared to the size of the building. I mean, it's not all that big. It looks imposing and impressive, but it's not that big. And I wonder whether there's more to it than you can actually see on the surface, possibly. But, um, spaceship, yes, <laughs> spaceship, or uh, maybe they fire a weapon out of the out of this bit here, you know, so into space. Um, and then this one, a little bit more peculiar. Anybody idea? Any ideas where this is? It's actually being constructed. It's finished now, but um, I bet there's not many of you in the audience will get this one. No. Well, this is an interesting one because this may be a sister to GCHQ. And not a lot of people know that. And guess where it is? Where? Nope, nope. It's something we've been talking about this evening. Corsham, yeah. And the thing about Corsham is you will hear, if you speak to people about Corsham and if you see things in the news, it's often saying, it always plays this game of saying, it's closing down, there's nothing there, nothing to see, um, you know, it's all gone away and yet lots of money on new facilities which do things that were supposed to have closed down which were like the HQ Southern Sector the radar stations and stuff underground but of course secretly in the Caution Computer Centre the CCC they were doing a lot of this stuff underground now because of the publicity of the, the base has had I think they basically brought it out onto the surface and they've said, right, we can do a lot of this stuff above ground now. And they've admitted that this is here. But what's interesting, I'll show you some documents now. This is the finished article. This is the buildings um, at Corsham. OK, is how this has come about. They've actually, I think, masked some of what this base does under saying that they need to create a new cyber warfare unit, which is side by side with GCHQ and in order to get the, the funding for it um, they basically said well we're going to appropriate a load of money for cyber warfare and this money's come down from uh, government and it's been appropriated in certain percentages those percentages are wrong but have a look at the figures in a second I'll, I'll show you uh... so they're actually asking for people to work at Corsham and uh... Let's have a little look here. Um, further down in the document, it says, members of the Joint Cyber Reserve Unit will provide support to Joint Cyber Command Unit. So Joint Cyber Unit, Corsham. The Joint Cyber Unit, Cheltenham, and other information assurance units across defence. OK? So you can apply to work there. Um, they're looking for people. And they even released photos um, in the local media around the area saying this is our control room so it's, it's like something out of um, NASA or you know what would you call uh, <laughs> Cheyenne Mountain
but on the surface. It's got screens. Now, the lights are on here for taking photos, but I believe that probably when it's operational, these lights are off because you want to see the video screens, which are up at the end, so they wouldn't be very good. As you can see, it wouldn't be very good if you, uh, if you kept the lights on. But this is what it was like when they released the photos. It may be more advanced than this now, um, but we'll come back. It's called the GOSCC, although I imagine that will change several times in the next few years in order to confuse people. Um, and yes, they said that they spent £650 million for an anti-cyber uh, warfare unit with 50% going to Cheltenham and 50% going to other home office and other departments. So remember these figures, 50% goes to Cheltenham and 50% goes to home office, etc., which would mean, you know, security service, London, that sort of stuff, yeah? But 650 million, okay? So this is a, a parliamentary document talking about the project to create a national cyber security program which has been launched under the management of the Office of Cybersecurity and Information Assurance in the Cabinet Office. 650 million has been allocated to the NSCP over the period, this is important, 2011 to 2015, of which 14%, which equates to 90 million, 90 million, has been allocated to the Ministry of Defence and 59% to the single intelligence account, right? So only 14% of 650 million, right? And that's, oh, so that's a zoom up, yeah. There we are, 2011 to 15, 14%, uh, which is 90 million out of 650 million. Okay, and it's str the strategy states that around half of the 650 million funding will go towards enhancing the UK's core capability, mainly at GCHQ in Cheltenham to detect cyber attacks. Okay, and I'm, It'll start to make sense in a minute, what I'm getting at with the point here. Um, yeah, I'll give you a bit of background. Uh, Caution Computer Centre was completely black budget funded. That bunker didn't exist on the books. Margaret Thatcher arranged for it to be funded off book so that nobody knew that it was there. And this is, you know, this has caused some controversy because, of course, you know, how does the money just disappear out of the coffers? And um, then you get a department like this comes along. And as you see, it's obviously been completed now. And they say the contract is for the MOD. The value of the contract for this company, 465 million. Well, that's just for a building in Corsham, right? And I thought 650 million was supposed to be allocated between 2011 to 2015, 14% of which was gonna go to the MOD. But apparently, 465 million on this base alone. So there's something wrong with the, the figures here somewhere. And I think the idea is they'll just spend the money in any way they, they like, and you won't get to say any different. Now, I'm just going to start up um, a video here, uh, which I have to do. All right, let's just zoom through it a bit. So you've got countryside. Um, you won't, you won't realise, but um, the reason I'm filming this is because in the trees, what you can't see is there's actually an, an emergency escape shaft for the bunkers here, which are part of the thing. But you can't see it very well, so that's why I'm pointing down at this area, because there's something in the, in the trees, which uh, I film at a later time on the ground. You actually see it on the ground. But there is the GOSCC. Okay, but what's interesting is I just decided to fly around. There's no air exclusion zone over this. I am a pilot. I know where I can fly and where I can't fly. There's nothing to say you can't, can't fly over this. There's no um, warnings about flying any aircraft over it and taking any photos. So I did, and I, I don't go right over the base because I know that might be pushing my luck a little bit at low altitude, but decided to go and have a look around. And what I've noticed is that a lot of these parts of the base which have been levelled have been built back up by outside companies. So true to their word, the MOD, you know, they said this base was closing down, it was closing down, there's nothing there, it's being sold off, you know, there's nothing to see, it's all being sold off to an electricity company and, you know, electricity company. Trouble is, 
It's all behind military fencing. And this is a data center, and this is a data center, and this is a data center. And if you have a look in a second, what, what was basically, um, I'm gonna, there's an air breather off site, that's a little air breather out in the countryside. But you can see these buildings here, which are supposedly owned by public companies. Um, they're off the main site. They're now, you know, supposedly publicly owned. Uh, yet, they're all data centers. And what do they, what do they serve a purpose for? They obviously serve a purpose for the Ministry of Defence. So I'm just zooming around. I'll just show you. So what you have, you have data centre, data centre, data centre, and that's the command and control centre across the road. So this doesn't have data centres, this doesn't have lots of uh, cooling facilities and computer facilities, and this does. But what we're told is, what we're, we're expected to believe is that this stuff is all publicly owned but it's behind an MOD line. Okay, interestingly, if you go and look up on Companies House, the names of the companies that these are, go and have a look on Companies House who owns these and who the names and go and check the names back. I believe that one of these buildings here is owned by, um, or, or, or she's a director, Manningford Buller. Is it Ma Eliza Mannington Buller or Manning, Manning and Buller? Yeah. She's only the head of MI5 or MI6, I think it was, yeah. And, and yet, you know, it's, it's all public now. It's all public, owned by the public, but, you know, company's house, there she is. She just happens to own one of the data centres <coughs> that serves this across the road, which is an intelligence unit, which is second to GCHQ. But hang on a minute. I thought that money was going to be appropriated to GCHQ in Cheltenham with 14% going back to the MOD. This is MOD. And all the money has been appropriated to this, not to Cheltenham. So I think questions are eventually going to get asked about this and, and what's going on. Anybody know where this building is? Any ideas? 50-50, phone a friend? No, yeah, I suppose I could see why. Yeah, the big open uh, thing there. Um, no, this is port and down. So that's actually the building for Port and Down, which has uh, its own law in UFO terms because of the alien bodies that somebody claimed that were taken there. So that's another secret base. So that's got uh, its own little connections. And I was talking to you about the, the fact that these departments change their names a lot. Well, here we are. This is a photo I took, the PLSD. I can't remember what that is now. Um, but it's C-A-M-R, uh, Center for Applied Microbiological Research. Um, there and then you could you could go there a couple of years later and it's now the health protection agency dstl you know and this keeps happening it keeps changing and changing and changing they keep changing the names and there's our friend peter who says that um he worked for the ministry of defense as a man in black and you know he's quite prepared to tell everybody about what he did and and what he was up to, which I, I think, well, hang on a minute, you know, if the MOD wouldn't probably like you doing that, which sounds a little bit unreasonable. Um, but I've been very critical of uh, Peter's stuff. I won't go into it here, it'll take a long time, but I've been very critical of it. I think a lot of it is, is quite fanciful. But because I've been criticizing his work, he turned around to me and said, um, you were going to be assassinated. The people at Rudlow Manor were going to assassinate you. And I'm like, really? Uh, yes, yes. And when, when it, came, it came across my desk, oh, yes, we need to assassinate Matt Williams. And, uh, and then I said, no, I know Matthew. He's a really nice guy. Don't assassinate him. And they went, oh, well, then, Peter, if you vouch for him, then he's OK. All right, we'll, we'll not assassinate him now. And I'm like, Pete, Peter, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, OK, well, all right, then, if you know about me, then please tell me something which was in these files which only you or those people would know because they were spying on me that nobody else knows. Tell me something that you can prove that validates that you, you were working in this role. And so far, I've had nothing. But, you know, a little bit off the, the deep end, really. But um, he claims he worked for 
uh, these UFO investigation departments and he reckons that he was implanted, he was put into the center of uh, UFO groups in order to receive the information in, pass it up the line to his chain of command and uh, then I would assume you know they would they would carry on doing their investigations with it. Um, why would he come out and say this if it was true? Why would he tell you that that was his role? Because it means that everybody would be very paranoid about who's around them today, you know, in, in places like this. And I mean, I meant to say earlier on, actually, if um, uh, would, the, would the person from Rudlow Manor please put their hand up now? Because we've had them, we've had them. And people who've actually worked at the base have actually said, I know he works for security. I see him over there, that guy. And then we've watched him carefully and they've got ta they're playing with tape recorders in their pockets whilst um, the, the talk's going on. And um, I've given him a nod and like, like that, and they're sort of like, oh, he knows who we are, quick, quick, get out, you know, and it's like, you know, so they do come to these things, they do, they are interested to find out what I've got to say and what I'm, what I'm up to, um, but I don't think what we've done is, is incredibly uh, dangerous, I'm just interested in UFO stuff, really, I mean, I'm not a terrorist, but, uh, you know, I'm just interested in getting good photos that we can publish in magazines and do articles with, you know, and, and my attitude on it has always been, if I can jump over your fence or if I can find out this information, then so can a real terrorist. So therefore, by doing it and by us keeping you on your toes, um, I think it kind of makes you a little bit more, you know, uh, it, it speeds you up a bit, gets you, gets you a, little bit, uh, a little bit better at your job. So, you know, I've never had a problem with um, what I'm doing from a point of view of uh, releasing the information. If it's in the public domain, then it's in the public domain. And like the stuff with the Public Records Office documents, it might have been embarrassing because we actually um, made public ahead of time something that they probably didn't want to have published. And that's why these documents are probably secretly put into the wrong documents. Because if you put them in the UFO document, well, they're looking through that to see if there's anything they don't want to be in there. So somebody who's wanting to leak these documents has actually put them in the wrong places. And then people like me who are actually looking purposely in the wrong places to see if I can find things, we're lucky enough to find them. And so that's what I would suggest to people. If you're looking, if you're looking for UFOs, don't go in the front door. Sometimes go around the side door, dig underground, fly overhead, drop in on a parachute. You know, it's like, don't just go straight because that's what they're expecting you to do. So anyway, um, I think that's probably about, uh, about time. So uh, hopefully I've given you a little bit of a flavor of some of the stuff I do with the investigations. I think that um, that department, the GOSCC, is now the current radar tracking and super sort of control center, which would have been like the HQ Southern Sector, which was back in the day, was tracking the radar reports of UFOs. We have those documents which say that that's what they did. They say it all shut down. We're shutting this place down. We're, you know, it's all going. And then, boom, massive injection of money. Boof, it's all back up again. It's doing exactly what it did in the past, but now it's doing it in the open because they know everybody knows it's there. Now it's been too well publicized. Oh, here we are, we're doing it now. And it's like, so it's, it's only just reinforcing what I've told people many times over the years. They can move the places around, they can shut some of them down, they can juggle them about like, like a deck of cards. And in the end, when you turn the cards over, they're all aces, you know? It's still there, it still does what it always did. And it's still a very important place. So, some of the bases that you've seen. Um, if you if you ever find anything out about these places, where they are now, I'd love to hear from you. So anyway, with that, I'll say thank you very much and uh, I'll take some questions. So, thank you. I'll, sh I'll show preference to uh, organizers here, look. Right. Steve. <laughs> yeah, coming back to crop circles briefly then. Yep. Most people would like to think that crop circles may be of avian orientation. Mm -hmm. um, You've obviously looked at a lot of them. Can yep. you put your hand on your heart and say that uh, one or two of them are more uh, are unlikely to be man-made? Uh, Steve's asking, are there any that are likely, any crop circles that might be genuinely alien? Um, Yes, or not man-made. Well, the, the thing is, if you watch, I, I'll tell you how to watch that I'm being a bit slippery on this one, okay? And, and I do it on purpose, and I tell people that I'm doing it as well, so they, if they pick up on it, I don't deny that I'm doing this. But the reason we do it is because 
people don't want to hear that it's humans making the crop circles, okay? They get very upset about it. And because we know that crop circles do create a lot of good and that humans are getting drawn to do these circles by something else, I believe that I've been given the idea to go out and do certain designs that have been asked for. I've had people meditating. I've gone 200 feet away from them and done a design that they're meditating on. I got called out of my house to do that. You know, all that is positive. But once you start talking about it being humans, you know, humans, I, I was part of that, I did that, then everyone goes, oh, they're not interested anymore. So part of the magic which is not the real magic. The real magic is the telepathy, the balls of light chasing you out of the field, all the weird stuff. That's the real magic. But part of the showmanship magic of making crop circles is you're supposed to keep your mouth shut and you have to give a bit of leeway for people to kind of still be interested in it all. So I do tell the truth when I say there are always some circles that appear every year and we don't know who makes them. That is true. The bit I leave out, which I, you, you'll see me saying it if you watch carefully on the show, is um, we usually do get to find out who made them, but it takes time. It takes like a couple of years and then we, oh, you're the guy who made that one. We wondered who that was. All oh, right. And it takes time. It's like the, the spirals, the two spirals. It took a few years until I met the people that did the other spiral. And we were like, wow, two spirals the same night. Who was the other team? We even got paranoid thinking it must be, you know, somebody we knew who kind of was doing it as a joke, you know, like, look, it's Matt's birthday and we'll do it, you know, on Matt's birthday and things like that. But genuinely, I believe that I met these people out of the blue and they were the guys that did that other spiral and nobody did know them, you know. And how does stuff like that keep happening? If, if you believe in, in the wonderment of it all, if you believe that it is real, then to destroy it for people is a bad thing. To sort of rip the carpet and rip, you know, rip the rug out from underneath them is, is not, you know, is not good. So we always try to leave a little bit of space in there. And to a certain degree, I will, I will fight the people like Peter who try to throw mud, you know, and we, we all throw mud back and forth against each other, but I will allow a certain amount of uh, crap relating to me in in relation to the crop circle subject because if people want to believe that we couldn't do them and if they want to say oh matt williams is a government agent he's, he's here to disinform and, and all that sort of stuff if they want to believe that fine if they know me really well they'll know that's not true but you know some people can handle the truth other people want magic they want aliens so it's you know we've done the show we don't do it anymore. It doesn't get many views, but it's there. It's historical, it's there, it's not going anywhere. If people want the truth, they can see it. But it isn't the truth most people want. So if people say to me, oh, you couldn't possibly make that crop circle, I go, yeah, probably. And they go, see, I, I knew it. You, even you admit you couldn't do it. Yeah, because they don't want to hear you say, yes, I could, because they'll go, well, prove it. Well, I can't prove it there and then for this person, click the fingers. So I mean, what can you do? And you know, if, if somebody's saying, look, I really like what you do, I think it's great, you know, and you go, okay, cool. You know, so you, you, made, you made some of these? Yep, yeah, right, they can handle it. But if somebody goes, you can't make these, can you? Well, you know exactly which angle they're coming in at. So it's like, you don't want me to say yes. So I'll say, well, no, of course I can't. Because you just, you know, you're trying to let people, let, let them have one over on you. Let them, let them push me back. Ooh, I can't, you can't win against your logic of people can't make them because you've never seen one being made. I can't win against that one. But, you know, that's what happens with people. You know, they don't want that sort of information. So we give them a, a bride, a, a, not a bride, a broad, or give them a bride even. We give them a broad, um, you know, a broad space around us. I just wanted to ask about some of the people who see the crop circles. You didn't know that some of the stalks are bent, they've got those funny nodules on them, so... Yeah, bent stems, yeah, well, knuckles, bent stems, blown nodes. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's yeah. That? right, it's called phototropism. Um, in case anybody didn't hear, he was asking about in crop circles, they have these um, knuckles at the uh, where the plant grows, it has knuckle points. And when it grows back towards the light, which a plant will normally do, you flatten it down, it'll start to grow back towards the light, and it can actually recover quite a lot in just one day, trying to, to, to go back up towards the light. It, sorry? What do you call it? What do it's called phototropism, that effect of trying to grow back towards the light. But what happens is the knuckle where it actually 
does the turning, that will split open because it's not it's not uh, a normal type of uh, thing that it, it, the plant wants to do. Normally the plant grows with that knuckle in place and it never needs to move. But if it has to move a lot, it can actually split at the corner. And then it seeps out uh, a, f a fluid, which is like yeast. And uh, this turns black on the outside of the plant, especially in the sun and the heat. It'll turn black. And this is what's been referred to as microwave damage, simply because it's black. And the people who came along and said, this is microwave damage. Well, the main guy called Dr. Levengood, I was chatting to somebody earlier on, he's not a real doctor. He's part of the BLT team, this research team. And this stuff about the, the, the plants and the blown nodes, they call them blown nodes because it blows out with the force of microwaves that have been applied to the plant and it blows, boosh, you know, it pops the, the, uh, the plant open and causes this burning. Well, it's not burning at all. It's just a natural uh, discoloration of the yeast. But, you know, that's an, that's an explanation which is clearly understood by most plant biologists. Yet you speak to people who are crop circle researchers and they just want to play the three monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, you know, speak no evil. And you say phototropism and they go, yeah, but not like any of the good ones though. And you go, which are the good ones? Oh, I'm not speaking to you now, you know, and it's like, you know, it's as it's plain as the nose on their face, but they don't want to accept it. It's called phototropism. That's it. Sorry, Steve, did I answer your question, by the way? I tend to go off on one. Well, I, did, I did answer it, did I? So you've not come across any yes. crop circle that is so complicated and accurate. Yeah. I'm coming at you from one of those angles you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That is so accurate and so complicated and constructed in such a time scale that it can't be planned. Some of the biggest, the biggest circles, which are the biggest head bogglers for people because they'd be the hardest to create. Um, all you just have to think about is, well, how many people would it take and how many hours would it take? Now add more people and, so, and you can divide out the amount of hours it'll take. If that, would if that would take three days for five people to create, if you put 10 people, if, 10 people in there, it might take a day and a half. If you put 20 people in there, you'll do it in under a day. You know, and it depends on the quality of the circle makers, whether or not they're fast or slow um, as well, you know, whether you've got good quality circle makers. But some of the biggest designs, which seem the most mind boggling, just think add more people, you know. And do they get made in one night? Some people think they do because they don't always get discovered. So actually some of them have been, the big ones have been done over more than one night, but because of their placement and because of the weather, they've not been discovered. And when they've been discovered, people say, well, that couldn't have been done in one night. Well, actually, it wasn't done in one night, you know, but you didn't discover it. So it was done over more than one night. And, uh, you know, it's just what you can get away with, really. You know, what you can actually manage to achieve that boggles the mind. And I'm sorry, I know humans are very creative and very uh, ingenuity, but I imagine time and people, but the more people you add on to it, the more there is forever and complication for things to go wrong, I Yeah, it gets, it, you could say that, but... I'm going to argue with every crossover being mm -hmm. the same magical even my name. There's just some of the ones I've seen or tried to look into as much as I possibly could from a computer standpoint anyway. Yeah, sure. It's like, you know, you want to milk kill the Catherine wheel. That was one I was going to mention. Yeah. I've gone into the mill kill one because I've got to be careful because I don't, you know, I'm not saying either way whether something like milk kill was man-made, but what I will say is, in my opinion, it could be man-made. Now, if I knew it was man-made, I wouldn't actually say. Well, if, if I had to guess, right, because this is the, I've got to be careful because I don't want to, if, I, if it was or it wasn't, I can't upset the people whose designs it is. If I do a design, then it comes down to me. If I want to reveal it, it's up to me because I'm revealing my own work. But what I shouldn't do is I shouldn't throw open uh, the, the the debate on somebody else's work, unless, of course, I'm saying in my opinion, but not for fact. You know, I can I can do it that way. If we talk about something like Milk Hill, in my opinion, um, it would take about 19 people. If, as a guess, I would imagine, um, was it done in one day? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't done in one day. Um, and is it extremely accurate? Because you said that you know it would be hard to keep um, people accurate was it accurate yeah no absolutely I, I know what you mean but the, the trouble is 
people will look at something like Milk Hill, and I do too, and you look at it and you go, whoa, yeah? Then, if you were to get out the measuring uh, compass and measure each circle, you'd notice that they vary. So the ones there are not the same as the ones there. So there's variation between the sizes on all the ones. But when you look at it from a distance, your brain doesn't see that. Your brain goes, perfect, 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 everything's perfect. When you actually start measuring and you, you weigh things up, you realize there's a lot more wobbliness and variation going on than the brain actually sees. The brain doesn't want to see the, the, the detail, the brain just wants to see the overall. <coughs> So, you know, I'd, I'd add that into the mix. But, uh, you know, people do make mistakes when they make crop circles, a lot of them. And if you make a really bad mistake, what you have to do is you have to put something really big on top of it to throw people off. It's almost like a distraction. It's like, it's, it's like um, a magician might do. He's like, you know, he doesn't want you to see the ball in this hand, so he starts talking to you and leaning and his hands behind his back. It's like with a crop circle, you make a mistake, put something really big over the top of it with lots of arms and sparkly bits and then nobody bothers to your eye just goes oh I'll go on to the next bit you know it, it doesn't stop on that bit but if you made the mistake and you walked away and left it everyone would go immediately look that's a mistake look that doesn't look right so what you do is you put something really gregarious on top of it and everybody goes that's meant to be there wow you know and then they don't spot the mistake it just just distracts your eye away from it but Emlyn um, the MOD public Desk. Nick Pope. Nick Pope, yeah. That used to be in the, in the, in the Secretariat Air Staff 2A, I believe it was called. It was closed down in 2009. So they say. So they say, yeah, well, publicly, yeah. Mm -hmm. What mechanism, what, what trigger do you think can cause to publicly announce that it was closed in, supposedly? Well, the, the whole thing about saying that UFOs are of no defence significance comes from the fact that the more that gets revealed about how they really are doing stuff, the more they put into play things that say, oh, we're shutting Redlow Manor, oh, we don't do that anymore, we're not interested, oh, you know, and it's, so realistically, I think that um, what they do when they shut down a, a desk like that is they're saying, it's all over now. When we know behind the scenes, like what happens with this base is, oh no, it's not really over at all, it's, it's, it's flowering and spiraling in the background, you know, and it's doing its own thing, and it'll pop back up again and there will be another desk and they'll probably go, oh, we have been doing it in the background, but not as much as you think. You know, it's like that. The one thing that MOD don't want is they don't want the public to get overexcited by UFOs because they've always said, and the documents relate to this as well, some of the documents we got actually stated it. They said um, the public take more seriously reports of UFOs when they come from credible sources such as the military, police, etc. Um, therefore, it is very important that we try to give the impression that we are not doing investigations on this matter because we do not want to excite the imaginations of the public. And they literally state that. So the whole point of Nick Pope's position was to do just that, is to say, there is nobody above me, it's just me. I'm doing my little investigations and I think it was probably nothing. But anyway, it's not a defence significance, nothing to worry about, thank you for much, very much for your letter. Yeah, it's play it down. It's literally there in the rule book for how you actually do it in some of these documents that we've got. That's how you do it. Where you send the files to, who does the investigation. Don't do this. Don't say this to the members of the public. It's all there. And Nick Pope was part of that mechanism. Now that he's out of the job and a few years have gone by, and because those departments are no longer situated in those buildings that they, they used to be in, and they probably changed their names, he can talk about it. But it took that, it took them to move from that building, change their names before he could safely say about it. Because he'd be breaking secrecy otherwise. Now we, now we don't know who these departments are. And of course, they don't really exist. And they're not doing stuff on UFOs, honest governor, you know? <coughs> so. Do you think they take much notice of uh, any reports coming from the public now though? Oh, absolutely, they have to. They totally take um, this stuff seriously because Incursions into airspace are a military matter. It could be a foreign government, it could be China, Russia, it could be any, any government. It could be um, genuine extraterrestrials. They are interested in that too. You know, what if something comes from outer space? And um, just to know whether or not uh, somebody is testing to penetrate, how can they penetrate? Can they get in, can they get out? And what sort of technologies are being used? 
if they can capture somebody's spy craft that they're trying to fly in and out, you know, if they could capture one of those, they could get new technology to create a new line of stuff that we could use as well. So they want to capture this stuff. So of course, any reports that come from members of the public saying, I saw this doing this, they take it seriously because they think, well, if we can work out a pattern of where these things are coming in and how to detect them, we might have a way to bring one down. Not just alien, but foreign technology. And I think it's a lot to do with wanting to get hold of this stuff to advance research. So yes. Sir. Do I think the government have ever, uh, ever told us the truth? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to think we, we will be told, and I also like to think that it will be become too obvious for the governments to hide anymore, i.e. we might have some sort of revelation event where something happens, you know, District 9, shum, you know, the UFO is hovering like V over a city, and what are you going to do about that then? You know, I'd like to think that we, we get some sort of thing happen which lets us know that we're not alone in the universe, and I think that would be good. Whereas we're always told, oh no, people will panic, they won't be able to take it, the MOD think it's not good for you to know this stuff, so they're going to keep it all to themselves. I don't think that's true. I think that the scenarios that the, the Ministry of Defence and American government put forward are worst case scenarios based on old thinking and I think we've moved on a lot since you know the days of the 1930s and I don't think you know necessarily everyone's going to run to get their shotgun because they see a UFO hovering outside you know I don't I don't think so but um, times are moving on and we're, we're getting closer to a, a time when if it was if it was disclosed there wouldn't be so much panic. I like to think so. Hopefully soon, but oh god, I got so many friends who keep on saying, "When's it gonna happen?" You know, and it's like, "Well, it's never gonna happen if you don't get off your ass." I always say, <laughs> so, "Do something about it." Yeah. But anybody else? No. Oh well. That's that's shut him up, didn't it? They say, oh, he's got an answer for everything. and not going to bother now. <laughs> he just he'd just have some answer for it, wouldn't he? <laughs> fifth column. Uh, the term fifth column is about, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's like communism, isn't it? It's like a... a, a yeah. Yeah, the secret government, you mean, fifth column. Well, I, I don't know, I've, I've heard about like fifth column is some sort of... Um, yeah, it's like it, secret secret spies, you know, like um, double agents and things like that. You know, it could be sort of, you know, underground resistance or underground, you know, enemies inside a country. I, I got a feeling that's what I remember as being like fifth column. But if you're talking about... Um, secret government keeping this stuff for themselves and yes having the power of life over life uh, li you know life and death um, there is a good book which you can read called um, I don't remember it now it's by Tony Collins uh, is, is it called defense of the realm um, I think it's called defense of the realm it's by uh, check with me on this um, it'll, it'll come back to me now red cover it's got talks about all the, de the deaths that were happening in the 1980s by people who were working for the Ministry of Defence on missile projects and uh, they were all going to Bristol to jump off the Clifton Suspension Bridge and you know committing suicide and then the newspaper reports were you know oh it was a cleaner you know didn't work for the MOD and it turned out when it was more investigated by journalists oh actually they did work for the MOD and they were mission specialists on, on rocketry systems and they always seem to be people of um, foreign nationality or foreign ancestry it wasn't like white male you know Eurasian you know it was like Indian people you know and Chinese people working inside the MOD and they were all sort of going to Bristol to jump off the, um, uh, the Clifton suspension bridge which was interesting um, and he, he talks about this a lot in the book it's going into how the coroner's reports were getting uh, whitewashed so that 
even though there was a lot to say that the deaths were suspicious, it was taken as no, it's just a normal suicide, forget about it. You know, and it's a bit like uh, David Kelly, you know, they say there's more to that than. Um, and they basically talk about in, in this book, and I've heard it a few times, there's a thing called um, the Three Wise Men. Have you heard about this? Three Wise Men. It's the, um, the mechanism inside the British Ministry of Defence whereby if somebody is deemed too much of a threat, they can actually put a, an execution warrant, which will be uh, done however you'll be assassinated. But it's, this is actually uh, action by the Three Wise Men. And it's talked about in, in that book. And there's also a, there's a, no, it's a movie called Defense of the Realm where you get to see the process with the three wise men and they bring in the journalist, ask him some questions, then decide he has to be done away with and they end up killing him. I won't say how because it'll spoil the movie. But um, somebody working on nuclear secrets. Uh, da -da -da -da, Tony Collins. It'll come back to me, otherwise I'll have a, I'll have a look and see if I can find out. Hilda Burrell. Burrell. Doesn't ring any bells at me. <coughs> right. Talking about um, nuclear waste and was supposed yeah. to put a government uh, paper to the government and then she got assassinated. It does happen. Um, not Jill something, is it? Jill... Mm. Yeah. Rings a bell. In that book, I got my Kindle. It's fantastic. Right, yeah. And it goes into other things as well about people who are hassled by government agents. And yeah. It's quite frightening, actually. And she used to work in GCHQ as well. Well, this is it. I mean, you know, people who work in government departments, they're heavily vetted and they're watched, they're surveilled to make sure they're not doing anything wrong. But I mean, if you show any signs that you could be up to something, you know, no good. Sometimes they'll, they'll put pressure on you um, in various ways. It'll be made obvious to you that, you know, we know what you're doing. And, it, you know, because they, they don't know what you're doing, but they'll, they'll put pressure on you to make you think and be paranoid that they do know what you're doing. I mean, this is why I used to, whenever I made phone calls, I used to say, I was <laughs> with Peter Padgett, whenever I used to make phone calls, me and my friend, we had an, uh, an agreement that we just talked rubbish down the phone to each other about what we were going to do at Rudlow Manor and this way if they were listening then tough luck to them because if they want to go hanging around looking for us that night we're not going to be there you know and we we wouldn't because we wouldn't discuss when we were going to go to Rudlow Manor but we talk about it and there were a couple of times and I think we said things like um, oh yes yes I've got the encrypted keys for the nuclear weapons yes yes the missiles we'll be flying tonight you know and things like this now I never told anybody, I don't think that I was joking around like that, but Peter did actually say, listen to your, we listened to your phone calls and that, that you said that you were going to break into um, uh, the base and, and set off nuclear weapons or something like that. And I thought, well, I might have discussed jokingly what we used to do in this respect. And that's about the closest he's ever come to anything, but it wasn't very specific, it wasn't incredibly specific. I mean, I, I probably have told people that we've done this in previous talks, but, you know, what he's saying is right, yes, they would be listening to us. And, you know, we had guys come to uh, UFO groups and interview individual people saying, what do you think about Matt Williams? What do you think about Matt Williams? And they were going around people, but they would never come to me. So like, th there's a Cheltenham UFO group. There were a number of people who had special branch like, what do you think of Matthew Williams? And they were all asked the question individually. They had people turn up at their houses and things. And Robin Cole actually got a card off one of them. And it wasn't the guy's real name. And, it, and it, the details of where he worked wasn't where he really worked. But Robin Cole actually tracked him down and actually rang this guy up. And he said, hello, I'm Robin. Remember me? You came around my house and you gave me a card. Your name was apparently blah, 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 blah. But this is really who you are. And, he, and the guy actually said, yeah, you're pretty good, you are. You, you've done pretty well to find out where, I, where I'm from. And he was special branch, but, you know, they were pretending to be from somewhere else when they were coming asking these questions. They weren't saying they were from special branch, but, yeah, they, they do monitor what people are doing. So... Well, if it, if it happens to me or Steve or Mike or anyone else, let me know. Put a tape recorder on. 
you've got to, you know, go for the toilet and put the tape recorder on. That's what Robin did. He was pretty good, actually. And it's hard to react properly and quickly in, in situations like that, unless it's happened to you a few times, because you'll just be like, oh, my God. But if you can remember to try and, try and record something and take photos, and when they leave, try and take a photo of the car registration number and things like that, you know, you'll thank yourself for it, because you, you've got something you can, you can do something with then. You know, but, uh, yeah. Oh, that's it. Oh, well, very quickly. Marconi. Yes, Marconi. We're part of. Ring a bell? Does that resonate with anything? Marconi and Raytheon. They used to work well. I used to work for associated with them. Yes. Uh, Marconi um, is a long, long, big story which you've alluded to. Yes. People get suicided. People get suicided. Yeah, that work How for these places. Done? Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So ask me, I'll look it up, Tony Collins, that book is dynamite. And if, if there was anybody, if you got Tony Collins to speak here, I would come to hear it because it, he is he's dynamite. That book is just, you know, next level stuff. You know, he's compiled all the information on all the deaths and how they were suspicious and how the coroner's reports were all fudged. You know, I mean, it's from a conspiracy angle, not necessarily UFO, but that's a talk I'd come to. So thanks very much. On behalf of Sufon, I'd like to thank you for coming all the way tonight. Thank you. And very sorry I didn't make it last time. Very sorry, yes. That's my... Uh... We, had a, we had a good discussion evening that night. Good, good. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank Cheers. You. Cheers. Thank you.